Okay, we're going to continue with our next tutorial in econometrics, and we're going to talk a little bit about interval estimation and hypothesis testing um, with linear regression. And let's keep going. Um, so let's talk about some confidence intervals. So basically, here's I'm going to talk about a little bit of the math, and then we'll go in how to do it. Okay. Um, so the first thing we want to do, what do we want to find? We want to find a confidence level. So basically, we want to find this guy and this guy low and high such that the actual t ratio that we get from our model lies in between there all right we know what this t ratio is going to be um and that's simple it's simply going to be our beta uh beta sub 2 so our actual estimated coefficient minus our hypothesized um um value for that coefficient over the standard error of that coefficient. Okay, so here's the thing. All of this stuff is findable right in the regression output, and I'm going to show you where it is. So really, this, this, this whole formula looks complicated, but it's really just plug and chug. And for the most part, when we're looking at, say, is this, this variable significant or not? And what we mean, is this statistically significant? And that is is our estimated coefficient different from zero. And so what we're normally going to be looking at is this beta. And I don't know why I put two in there. It could be any one of them, but what, what the heck? Well, we'll go up for two, um, but it could be three. It could be four. Um, you know, we even do it for one. Um, you know, we do it for the, the constant too, although we don't normally care. Um, and then the standard error of, all right, B2, there you go. That's it. All right, and that's going to be this T ratio. Um, and that's and this is directly reported in most regression output. So in R, it's reported as the T value. And, you know, I would say about half the time it's called that way. About the other half of the time, um, programs call it the T ratio because it's, literally the coefficient divided by the coefficient standard error so it's a ratio and it has a t distribution all right so either way i call it t ratio here just i don't know why because i'm honoring i guess okay so rearrange these terms we can get well all of this crack and basically what we're looking at is okay i want to know what's a confidence level i bring this around i want the probability of this interval of being within this interval to equal whatever my confidence level is. And that's, you know, oftentimes it's 0.95. Um, it's always, um, you know, one minus alpha, right? Where alpha is our significance level. Um, so what we've got here is our estimate minus the radius of our confidence interval plus the radius of our confidence level. And of course we've got this beta two in there and since we know the bottom we know the top we can kind of get rid of all this stuff in the middle and we get right here is our confidence interval for a given coefficient and it's going to be beta 2 minus the number of uh, the number of the, the you know the number of standard errors below and above the mean we need to be able to achieve this confidence interval times the standard error. Okay, easy peasy. That's all there is to it. Um, now, if that math is confusing, it's not absolutely essential that you know it for this, I know it completely for this class um, to be able to use it, but it is a good idea to at least have an idea of what's going on. In particular, what we're saying is the probability, the, the, the probability that the true coefficient lies between here and here is equal to our confidence level. And that's where this confidence interval comes from. Okay? Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. All right. So let's, let's keep going forward. And let's try to use this a little bit more. We'll make it make a little more sense. So this is kind of the general notation for this. Okay, we have a 
whatever coefficient, so the kth coefficient, whichever one it is, doesn't matter, um, and it's a little k, is equal to the standard error of that coefficient times the t value associated with the probability 1 minus alpha over 2. So remember, we want, this is my t distribution. I want alpha over 2 here and alpha over 2 here. And this is my confidence. So my this is my confidence level. The alpha is my significance level. All right, so I'm confidence level confident that the true coefficient lies in here. That's what we're going for. And so this guy is just the how many how many standard errors below the um, coefficient I have to go to get there. And this is going to be how many standard errors above the coefficient I have to get there. And t, and we just get that from t. n minus k is my degrees of freedom. n is the number of observations. k is the number of parameters. Now note, um, some textbooks are going to say this is n minus k um, minus 1. Because k, some textbooks won't include the constant in their notation. But your textbook, I think more correctly, includes the constant in k. And so k is the total number of parameters, the total number of coefficients you estimate. So um, if I estimate one independent variable, I've also got a constant in there. So k is actually 2, right? OK. We'll keep moving along. So let's do this. Let's estimate a model. So first of all, we'll estimate this, this quadratic model. And remember, when I want to square advertisement, I have to use this silly I notation. Um, and, and this is really weird to me because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I grew up with, um, you know, matrix programming languages and you'll have an I function um, that gives you uh, an identity matrix. So basically, you know, a matrix that looks like this. One, one, one with zero, 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 zero. So something like that. So that's a three by three identity matrix. And what's really cool about that is um, if I multiply this by another matrix such that matrix multiplication makes sense, I'll get that other matrix right back. All right. That's why it's called the identity matrix. It just gives you the identity. It just it's like multiplying by one in scalars. In any event, um, and so that's really weird to me that they use it that way, but this is how they do it. When you put this advert squared inside of this i function, it tells the lm function, do this exactly, do it verbatim. Don't, don't do anything weird, right? Like, for example, the multiplication symbol and the colon symbol have special meanings within lm. We're going to talk about those just a little bit later. When you put it inside the I, it says, don't worry about that. Just do the mathematical operation. Um, so anytime you want to do something like a square or something like that, put it inside of I. Now, log is different because log is in and of itself a function. And so you don't have to have to put the log inside of this, this I thing. OK, now that we got all of that, whether 2 and Y4 done, we're going to do summary of mod 2. And we see here it is. Um, and I use the full summary function rather than the sum function um, for right now. And let's let's have a look at what this looks like. First of all, come down here. Here's the standard error of each one of the coefficients. All right. And if I take the coefficient, so here price divided by the standard error, I get the t value, which is why a lot of programs call that a t-ratio. And this um, t-value, or t-statistic, sometimes they also call it the t-stat. Um, actually, I think I'm more comfortable just calling it the t-stat, but you know, whatever. Um, this t-stat has a t-distribution with, wait for it, n minus k degrees of freedom. Or, in this case, 71 degrees of freedom. Because I had uh, a total of, where are my total observations? Does it tell me? 
Oh, summary doesn't tell me total number of observations. That's a bummer. Um, but I have one, two, three, four parameters. So I have 75 observations. So 75 minus, or no, one, two, three, four. Yeah, 75 minus four is 71. So that's why I have 71 degrees of freedom. And so that's what this t distribution does. And this p value is the p value associated with the hypothesis test. All right, call this beta, or we'll call it b1, or I'm not, I'm sorry, two, because that's what the book's notation is. And that is HO is that B2 equals zero. HA is that B2 does not equal zero. All right. And so we see a tiny p-value. So remember, if the p-value is small, reject the null. So we reject that null hypothesis because the p-value is small. Or if you really want the for dummies version, if there are stars, um, reject the reject the null. If there are stars, the coefficient is significant. So three stars, really significant. Two stars, actually three stars, really, really significant. Two stars, really significant. One star um, uh, is, is significant. It is significant. I don't know. I, actually, there, there's lots of stars here. Um, so from dot all the way up to the star, all the stars is really significant. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, you can read down here. That's kind of overall a silly argument anyway. So if there are stars, it's definitely significant. Um, don't use that. Just look at the p-value. If, if your alpha level is 0 0.05, if this is less than 0 0.05, then it's significant. Um, and that's it. All right, so let's calculate this confidence interval. We're going to do it by hand. All right, the first thing we need to do is we need to get the coefficients out of this. So we're going to sum model. We're going to get the coefficients. And so that is in this inside of the summary from, um, um, object, there is a matrix called coefficients. And in the first row of that, or um, I'm sorry, yeah, first first column of that um, coefficient of that <clears throat> uh, matrix of coefficients is the actual coefficients. In the second column is the standard errors, and then we're going to use this df dot residuals on mod two to get the degrees of freedom. So we calculate all those things. All right. Now notice a couple things here. One, I'm I'm getting a matrix and then I'm I'm referencing that. All right. I reference that by putting in brackets what numbers I want. And what this tells the computer is I want all of the rows, first column. Second bit, I want all of the rows. That's why I put the comma there, second column. Okay, if I didn't put the comma, I, I wouldn't get them all, all right? It would actually, it would just screw up a little bit. So that comma looks weird, but it's not a mistake. It, it needs to be there. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, let's store our alpha. So we're going to have 0 0.05, which is just 95% uh, confidence level, you know, standard stuff. And let's get our TC or our, you know, that, that T stat. How many standard errors below? How many standard errors above? I need to be. All right, so let's find that. We're going to use QT. Um, QT is we know the quantity. We want to know, well, we know the probability. We want the quantity. We want the actual T value or T stat for this. Um, and so we put in P which is our probability of one minus alpha over two. Okay, that is just, you know, that's just the standard for um, finding confidence interval. And the number of degrees of freedom equals our degrees of freedom that we pulled out of the model here, which is n minus k, n is 75, k is four, so n minus k is 71. And so we get the 71 here, and yes, I should have made you do that by hand, but 
Hey, it's in the computer. We'll pull that out. Okay. And then the next thing is we're going to do, I call it, you know, mo. All right. Margin of error. I'm not sure that's right, exactly the right use of the word margin of error, but it just sounds fun to say mo. Um, so we find the mo, um, which is the standard error times this TC. Now, look at what happened here. I'm multiplying the standard error. That actually is a vector. Okay. So it's multiple numbers. And so what it's going to do is it's going to do element-wise multiplication. So it's going to take TC times the first number, times the, the standard error of the intercept, times the standard error of price, times the standard error of advert, times the standard error of advert squared. Isn't that cool? And it gives you this cool vector. Notice I put the whole thing in parentheses so it would print out so we could see what it looked like. Yep, yep. All right, next, let's just keep going. And we're going to continue to look at this. So we're going to do, we're going to do our confidence interval. And I'm going to use this function cbind. What cbind does is it says, OK, you got these vectors. Line them up like columns. Make them into columns. And stick them all together as if they were columns to make a matrix. All right, so put them together in, in terms of columns. And so I wanted to put the coefficients in there. And then I'm going to put the coefficient minus my standard errors. And notice it's going to do element-wise subtraction. So it's going to subtract this, each, the um, that MOE from each coefficient. And then it's going to add that MOE to each coefficient. Then I'm going to say, oh, then all I'm doing here is I'm going to name the, the columns. All right, so it looks pretty. That's all. Oh, and then I'm going to use this funky cable function. Um, no, it has nothing to do with that guy, um, which just lets me set the number of digits. It doesn't matter if you do that or not, and spit it out. And so here are my coefficients, and here are my confidence intervals. Bing, did it all by hand. Whew, that's a lot of work, right? You know me. You know there's got to be an easier way, right? Okay, well, we could just do that. You're saying, what the hell, man? Come on, you mean you made us go through all of that and listen to you prattle on about all those different commands when you could have done it with one? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's, you know, we gotta get our perks somehow, you know what I mean? It's just gotta get your kicks somehow. Actually, no, it's not really true. Understanding what's going on is really important. Um, you should be able to go in and do this, quote unquote, by hand. Um, uh, but, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, no, you're not going to. You're going to use something like this. Or um, or you use, like, sum. And then you'll set the um, argument to have it calculate confidence intervals for you. Um, and, and it'll put out a table that has the confidence intervals for all of the um, coefficients. It's actually really quite convenient. Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about hypothesis testing. We've already talked about that just a smidge, but let's really dive into it and make sure we understand what we're talking about. So we need to ask whether the data provided any evidence to suggest that Y is related to each of the explanatory variables. All right. Um, what evidence do we have that the, the relationship really is real and not just, they're just not related? Um, so if a given explanatory variable has no bearing on y, then its coefficient in a linear regression should be 0. So when we test this null hypothesis, it's called the test of significance. All right, so if we want to test the coefficient, beta x is significant. So or I'm yeah, so this is of x, we'll call this k, all right, to go along with x. So ho it's going to be it equals zero, and H A is that B K nothing to do with Burger King equals or does not equal zero. Bingo. My horrible handwriting notwithstanding. Easy peasy. So let's keep going. How we do that? Ah, looky there! I even wrote it for you with without terrible handwriting. Isn't that awesome? All right, and we get this T ratio. It looks like this. Right, because BK, the null hypothesis is at zero. So this is minus beta K, but beta K is zero. So boof, that all goes away. 
and we get this this t ratio and of course this has a t distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom and so we can easily calculate this so the t ratio is going to be our coefficients divided by our standard error bing our p values are simply going to be two times two times why two times because this is a um, two-sided test right it's two-sided because we have equals versus not equals there's two different ways to be not equal you can be too big or you can be too small so you have to get both tails all right so it's going to be two times all right now what we're going to do is one minus pt pt gives us the probability when we have the quantity our quantity is and i find it easier to do it this way if you don't you have to worry about negatives and whatnot but the t distribution is symmetric so we're just going to take the absolute value of this t ratio all right that's this up here where we take the coefficient divided by standard error it really doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive because it's two-sided and it is um um oh what am i trying to say it's two-sided and the um it's symmetric so abs of the t ratio degrees of freedom that gives me my p-value and here are the p-values and you'll notice if you look at these p-values very carefully and you remember back the original model we estimated and the summary output that we had it had these p-values you're going to see they're the exact they're the, they're the same numbers okay so that's how to do it by hand we'll put it all together we're going to use the sum function from j tools we're going to give it mod 2 let's tell it to do it with four digits um, and conf int tell it to give us the confidence intervals and it prints out this beautiful little um, table that has the coefficient it has the confidence interval for those coefficients it has the t value or that t ratio and then the p value that we calculated to go along with this so yes all of this stuff that we just did the the confidence intervals and the um, hypothesis testing we can entirely do with that line of code isn't that cool now you tell me you can do that that easily in excel you just can't all right awesome and sorry guys i got a little lazy i didn't put the little big star with the gold star with the you did it but hey good job you made it through